Hi, my name's Mark Richardson. I'm a drummer with Skunk and Nancy and also a founding trustee of Music Support. Uh, music Support is a charity who helps those in the music and events industry affected by mental ill health and or addiction. It's our fifth birthday this month and as part of our celebrations, we're meeting some of those people that have been impacted by the charity. We're really pleased to welcome fellow musician, Josh Franceschi, who is one fifth of the global rock band, You Me at Six. Welcome, Josh. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, we'll get we'll get to chat in a minute, but I'll just get through this this housekeeping first. We're going to have a chat about music support, uh, mental health, and addiction in the music industry in life, um, and we're going to share five images between us: three from jo from Josh and two from me that highlight. Um, significant parts of our career, I would say, relevant to um, mental health in the music and, and, and our careers, really. Um, some of these moments you might think look incredible, but um, and they, they are incredible images, but I think you agree, Josh, what was going on under the surface was a very, very different story. Yeah. Um, uh, as well as well as this, Josh is going to help us raise some funds for our, our fifth birthday um, by donating. What are you going to donate? I think it's some uh, some signed merch, some signed yeah. vinyls and stuff like that. So oh, good, good Brilliant. stuff. For you so a, a bundle of of signed merch. Um, and the goodies. I'm sure we can throw in some uh, some gig tickets as well. Oh, yeah, that, wow. that probably won't be a problem. Amazing. I might nick them for myself. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> time. Just kidding. Um, brilliant prize there um, from Josh. So if you want to have a chance of winning that, um, you need to visit the Just Giving page that we're setting up uh, just for this prize, um, which will be put in the link below. Just quickly before we start, Josh, how's lockdown been for you, given you know the current state of the industry? What's What's going on? Yeah, I think it was, um, I think for, for most, I think it kind of came in waves, you know, like some, I went through phases was like, oh, you know, I'm killing this, it's all good. Um, and then just periods of time where it's like, this seems never ending. Um, but I think there was just a constant sort of, constant thing going on in my head where I was like, it, it, there's a lot of other people that are suffering a lot, a lot more than I am in terms of, um, you know, those the key workers that are putting their lives in the line and stuff like that and or people that have been affected by you know um losing family or friends because of the, of the coronavirus so i think with uh all good and bad stuff i've learned to have a bit of perspective um over the years so yeah i'm i'm, I'm happy for my health and, and great for my health and my family's health so yeah all things considered not too bad what about yourself yeah, it's been. I've, I've found it really tricky at times, but I think, like you say, it's been it's been a really nice reset uh, as well. You know, it's been a, a time to sort of. I mean, I've been really fortunate in that um, we've got a house that needs a lot of work doing to it. So I've just been digging into that, and I've been digging a ditch this morning, which I've got to go back to after this. You know, it's the glamour that keeps me going. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's it's really been quite tough mentally because you know as i'm sure is the case for you guys the tours have been just keep getting postponed and i was now with postponed to next spring so it's kind of like you know and and that's the bit that i love more than anything of being in a band is those two hours on stage you know so i've sort of you know we've kind of been tempted by um you know things are getting better and then you know the carrot the dangling carrot sort of scenario you know and and um, it just keeps getting put further and further away but again like you said it's everyone's healthy you know um we, we've all had our jabs and um you know just what an amazing job how fortunate we are to live in a country where the, the healthcare with the healthcare system that we've got you know and a lot of people bemoan it but um i think if if you know if <laughs> I think it's pretty unfair to moan about a system that have coped so well um, with, with this thing the way they have and kept us all safe. You know, I think it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, similar really, struggled, but 
really reset and have had have just felt really fortunate. I suppose we should probably get to the reason why we're here, which is these five images are are perfect or not so perfect five images, um, depending on how you look at it. So image one, um, tell us about that, Josh. So image one is um, is me, Matt, and I think Max is sort of out of, out of shot. He's walking away, but we're uh, it's when we headlined the O2 Arena in um, 2015. Well, it was us and all time low, so it was actually a co-headline tour. But yeah. um, the reason this is kind of like an interesting picture, I guess, is um, about three weeks before the tour. So I guess like we, at that point, we'd done a few like, we'd done like Wembley, we'd done a few like, you know, like Nottingham Arena or Cardiff Arena, but we'd never done like an arena tour where like we were the closing act and we were all just so like pumped for it and felt like it was a real moment. Um, and yeah, and I, I kind of went into, I played like seven aside football a few weeks before it and I broke my ankle. Um, and so then all this stuff started coming out with being like, you know, all the pressure of could we actually move the tour Would the insurance cover it? They wouldn't. Then it was like, how are you actually going to do a tour? I didn't want to do it in a boot because I didn't want people to know that I was, um, you know, well, that I wasn't like there, if that makes sense, as a performer. It's one thing singing, but as a front man, um, you know, it's like you want to kind of like dominate the stage. You want to really like kind of galvanize the troops, if you like, and get people going. So yeah, yeah. the reason I chose this image was because it's kind of like a split I guess like a split outlook on on like one of our biggest highlights of our career, which is that we're on stage, we're playing in these arenas every night, and on the surface everything looks good, but I don't remember anything about this tour. Like not even I can't I can even tell you one, re regardless of how insignificant it might be, one little me memory of it because I was just pumped with so many drugs to get me not like you know class A or like that, but like medicinal stuff to try and like pain get killers. through painkillers yeah and just trying to get me through the, the thing the tour the, the shows and um it's a bit sweet and you know I, that was the first tour that I'd ever been as part of you meet six where I didn't travel with the band I was on my own in a car because I couldn't get up and down on a bus so I was kind of like basically rolling in sort of like two three afternoon two three o'clock in the afternoon every day after driving all morning you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but again, it goes back to that thing of like, you know, you are, you play a massive show, you want to go out with your friends or have a few beers or, you know, then have a little party on the bus or whatever. And so I was missing out on all that and then being like restricted in my performance on stage. And then, yeah, to kind of put the chair on top, like I, I couldn't remember, even from like day to day, I couldn't remember what happened the night before. And it's, yeah, it's just a strange thing. So I think that was definitely, um, one of like our biggest celebrations as a group, but one of individually, it was probably one of the, my toughest times because you just had to really go and put on like a, a brave face, if you like. Um, and I guess that's kind of part of the gig, isn't it really? Like if you're a performer, you have to try and, your, your, only, your only goal is to give the audience a night to remember. It kind of becomes like, you know, everything else is secondary to that. So those amazing moments, you really want to cherish them, don't you? And you, and you want to remember them and and i can't i can't imagine what it must be like to look back at that picture and not remember taking it or not remember the gigs mm. or you know what i mean and not remember the euphoria of the shows and and not being able to hang out with your mates and and um and really enjoy it and sort of um, that must have been really really tough yeah yeah pretty bleak but pretty bleak. good yeah <laughs> <laughs> when you think it's just maybe more determined to get back there you know yeah um, yeah. And I think that's the thing is that, you know, something that I think every artist in the, around the world, it's very rare that actually universally, you know, um, because so often it's kind of like, I think in the music industry in particular, it's like this sort of like, it's quite primal almost. It's like, this is our territory, you know, like this is our piece of land and this is our success and we don't want, you know, to share it if you like. And then this is one common experience that we've all had, which is this, it's like ground zero, really. Like we've all been stripped of something that was so yeah. um, potent in our lives and like really like kind of like, you know, I, I, I found at times during this pandemic, I was like, who am I without you me at six? And I discovered I wasn't sure if I knew anything about myself without this, these crutches essentially um, that had helped me sort of get around life, you know, being this thing of, well, I've got a purpose. I've got, 
this to get out of bed for in the morning. And when that all sort of gets stripped away, I think this is kind of the first time that we've had across an industry where everybody is, is mourning the same thing. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's made everybody more appreciative of the concept of uh, how integral live music is to, you know, not only our own happiness and, and, and obviously as entertainers, but also like for everybody else. And like, for me, like living in London, taking for granted years of like being off tour and not going to see live music and not going to shows because I couldn't be asked. Um, it's just really something that I, I, will, I will not look at music in that way. I will not take it for granted. And I think that, um, yeah, I think we're all, I think every artist, you know, right now, if, if they aren't feeling this way, should be thinking, right, this is a, this is a one, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to go out and really, you know, go and put on the shows of your lives as of now and make sure that every show you play it like it's your last because, you know, the last gig we played was two, September 2019 in uh, Gunnersbury Park and I definitely yeah. at the time did not think that was going to be our last gig. So I, I definitely won't be taking any of this sort of stuff for granted moving forward. Yeah. Now, I'm never going to complain about a, a lobby call <laughs> or, uh, or, or, an, or an early alarm for a, an airport transit ever again. Yeah, or not enough, uh, you know, bread in the dressing room or whatever. Or you ice, know. the drinks, more importantly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you've got to move on, haven't you? You've got yeah. to move on. Um, and so should we, um, which brings us <laughs> to our second picture. This is me on a, a splitter bus in, I think, 1996. It's, it's really, I was actually looking for another picture, um, but I came across this one and I thought, oh my God, who does that bloke think he is? Because <laughs> cause it's not me. It's not me. We were, it was, as hedonism was hitting across Europe and we were touring the UK and um, the, venue, the venue size had gone from sort of water rats and, you know, the joiners and all of that sort of stuff to... The 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 the, the, um, the town halls. It was before O twos. I'm I'm an old git, so it was before all the O O twos and all that kicked off. And um, I was just totally, you know, we we touched on it before. I was just completely defined by what I did, by my job, and and I just became this this person that um, I didn't recognise. I guess this is probably the start of my um, addiction problems. I mean, I think I always, I always binge drank um, through adolescence and down the rock club and all that kind of stuff. And I dabbled, dabbled in drugs and had, you know, really unhealthy relationships and all that kind of stuff. But I think at this point, because I joined the band um, when um, Charity was released, and I'd sort of missed the first few singles and then Charity was released and then Week was released. And that did, um, we, you know, on the back of a few sort of European tours, did us so many favours. Then we did this massive European sort of club tour. And then the second album came out, and Hedonism came out, and that just sort of catapulted us into the arenas. Not, not everywhere, but um, um, certainly Italy and Portugal and, you know, a lot of places around Europe and, and I was just starting this picture to me represents the beginning of well you know I'm the man <laughs> that kind of, I don't know if you ever went through it but um just that attitude of like I just I'm just invincible and I'm I, I have no idea at this at this stage who I am really what I like uh, what I want, I just know I'm in, I'm in the drummer in this band that's doing really, really well, and it's all I've ever wanted. Um, and How old it, are you in this picture? I am 26 in that picture. Okay. So <clears throat> I joined Little Angels at 21, and at that point I'd sort of fulfilled my dream, then that fell apart and thought, well, that's my chance, there it goes. And then um, Skunk and Nancy came along um, just by ch a chance meeting at the Kerrang Awards and and um, and and I joined Skunk and Nancy and so sort of at 26 I was kind of like well second chance you know mm. this this is it kind of thing I'm gonna go out and have flames of glory like. flames of glory totally I look at him and I just think you, and what on the one hand um, I say him because it's it's just a different person on the one hand I was like you know 
pretending to be somebody I wasn't really. That's what I see. I see somebody that's pretending to be someone he's not, really sadly, actually. Somebody wasn't comfortable in his own skin um, and it's just was just kind of a little kid, really, that had to put on this um, mask um, of this, this rock star sort of mask to try and... I mean, if any of the band heard me talking like this, they'd probably say, what are you on about? You know, you were, you were fine, you were right laugh, and, you know, and cause probably because I was pissed most of the time. But because um, I fell into addiction, not quite badly became, not badly is the wrong word, but I became quite dependent on drugs and alcohol to the point where I was addicted not long after this um, picture was taken. Mm. In fact, it was in, I was, you know, it was, I was on the way. <laughs> I was on the way, definitely. When do you think, do you think that comes from also like, though, there's like that stigma, or not even stigma, but there, there is that stereotype of like, the rock and roller, right? If you yeah. like. I think it's more, more often than not, people get caught up in what they believe they're supposed to be, what yeah. person does they believe that is expected from those around them. So for example, you know, like you go to places like the Crane Awards or, or Music Awards in general, or you're on your big arena tour and you're, or you're on your big sort of theatre tour. And there's sort of like this thing of like, you know, your friends, or your family come down to the gig. It's like, yeah, you're at my fucking gig. There's thousands of people out there that think I'm the man or the woman, yeah. whatever you like. And you get carried away of like this idea and this stereotype of what you're supposed to be. And I think more often than not, you know, we are, we are who we surround ourselves with as well. So it's like, I've seen it happen more, well, a few years ago in our band, but before that I saw it happen with so many other bands we were on tour with that like, mm. you know, if, if one person was, dabbling in drugs or cracking a beer at 11 a.m. Then everyone else thought, well, they're doing it. We're playing a show in Austria tonight. You know, we might as well. It's a Tuesday. Do you know what I mean? And I think it's yeah. like, it's very difficult not to get caught up in that, I think. And I think yeah. it takes a strong person. So I think you should give yourself credit because I think it takes a strong person to recognize, hang on, am I, am I buying into my own hype too much? Mm -hmm. And it takes a strong group of people to keep, a band like in the way that you have going for as long as you have by recognizing okay well you know what? i don't love this version of myself i don't hate them either but i just don't love them i don't recognize them in in what i and who and what i want to be and represent but i don't think there's a single especially like being like english as well and that sounds kind of stupid like but i've talked with so many american bands and it's like let's meditate and do yoga and like we're clean. We only have fruit and fiber and all that sort of shit. Whereas we're like, yeah, it's chain ciggies and drink pints. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know why, but like, I guess all the bands before us, like, they kind of set the standards. You think, well, we've got to do the same thing. Yeah, um, there was definitely an element of of falling into that that um, cliche and that. You yeah. Know? And um, I think the interesting thing about this photograph is that you know it was it was only the the skin calling me up and saying you know what you need to sort yourself out mate otherwise you're out you know yeah. that was what woke me up it wasn't like oh this is really bad for your health or you know your family's falling to bits or you know the, i mean the fact that i was drinking and drugging so much was a lot to do with my relationships outside of the band you know in a person in my personal life and that's sort of why the shit at the fan kind of thing but um you know, it was only when I was threatened with losing my job, which is what defined me as a person, mm. um, that I was able to kind of go, oh, Christ, okay, well, I need to sort myself out then. How do I do that? You know, and there was no help. There was no help. And that's part of the reason music support exists, because I wanted to change that, you know. Mm. Uh, it took a long time uh, for me to meet the right people and all that kind of stuff. But it actually led to, you know, uh, wanting to help others find information more easily so mm. although i see it i see sort of a little by lost kind of thing um in some senses it did lead to where we are so it's not all bad so moving on image three yes yeah, i mean it, it's um it's quite a whatever picture you know it's not like um but it it's because of where it was taken and when it was taken so interesting the way that you just spoke about how sort of like the inception of music support and 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 how that's kind of all transpired this is this is the like 
a pitch that was taken on a night where I was at complete rock bottom. And actually it's music support and, and Matt Thomas in particular, who I spent a lot of time talking to that really kind of pulled me out of, this is, this is the only time in my life on this exact night that I, you know, wanted to kill myself. Yeah. Um, and I don't say that, you know, lightly. It's, it's been, you know, it was definitely a, a dark, dark night. I mean, I've kind of, we were in Leipzig, Germany. Um, I completely lost who I was. I was doing things. Um, I was treating alcohol as if it was um, a vehicle for escapism, which I think as soon as you start treating anything like that, it's no bueno. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, this is sort of like half a bottle of Jameson before you go on. And, I, you know, the lads would take, they didn't know what I was going through at the time, but they would take the piss. They'd be like, you've got Jameson on, on, on stage, you've got a tequila soda, you've got a glass of red wine, and you've got a gin and tonic because we're all having one. And by the time I come off, they'd all be gone and sometimes topped up. So my relationship with alcohol at that time was very disturbing. Even I, even, you know, even not just looking retrospectively, but at the time I knew there was something going on massively wrong. And we were playing um, a song, uh, a song of us called Take On The World. And I just broke down crying on stage whilst the song was happening. And it was a song before our encore. Um, I don't know why we do all, I hate encores, but we, we, we do them. Um, I don't know what it's about, but you know what I mean. And- uh, want more glory. Yeah, exactly. You, you just want that extra validation, don't you? Um, but yeah, and I ran off stage sort of three quarters of, of the way through the song. And that where the way the venue was laid out, it was literally a toilet right next to where you came off stage. I went in there and locked the door and just was just howling, howling, crying. And just, yeah, dealing with just a lot of pain and a lot of self self-hate as well i think i would also got into a bit of a rut of just being we were on the tour, we were on the road so much and i was just so tired of being fake happy to yeah yeah to stop, you know like because you don't want to be and i'm not even just talking about with the touring crew and, and the lads and, and and the crew we take out but i'm talking like after shows like pretending to be happy to the fans pretending to be happy on stage pretending to be like I'd lost all sense of what, what gratitude I had for the band. I was completely like just in my own, my own head. Mm. So our tour manager was trying to get me back on stage. Um, and eventually I think Dan, our drummer was like, come on mate, you know, you, I don't know what's going on, but you've just, you've just got to pull through for just two more songs sort of thing. Came out, did it, and then ran straight back into it. And it was the first time that I'd gone on a walk around Leipzig before that and I'd found, I'd found this bridge whilst I was out on my walk and I was like, just sort of looking at myself in the mirror being like, how do I get out of this venue to that bridge so I can jump off it? Like, how do I do that without some, some of the fans seeing us or without one of the lads stopping me backstage to make sure I'm all right with some bullshit. So I must've been in the toilet for about two hours, three hours, just me in there with a bottle of Jameson, taking my belt off, just trying to figure out if I could, you know, do do it in there. Um, very, very extreme. And eventually it got to about two o'clock in the morning, you know, you sort of get empty out the venue. So I grabbed my stuff, had a shower, and our guitarist Max was like, What's what's going on, mate? Because, you know, I know something's going on. And I didn't tell I just I was well, I did tell him, I was just like, mate, I just want to die. I don't want to be here anymore. And it's the I think it's the first time in my life that I was truly scared of, I wasn't scared for myself, but I was scared of like what, what mark I would leave on people. And so then it, it was started off with like this wave of like deep self-hatred, but then also like immense guilt. Cause I started thinking of my mum, my sister, my dad, my grandmother, the boys. I was, and I was just kind of like, fuck, this is going to fuck them up, you know? And that's what was starting to, to really freak me out. Um, because, you know, I was, I was done with the world, but maybe the world wasn't done with me, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like yeah. this weird. And maybe, maybe that question that came, maybe that came at the right time, you know, what's going on? Are you okay? Kind of thing. 
came yeah, at exactly think, the right time. I think so, and and um, and maybe actually in, in a weird way, if I'd been in a different environment, if I hadn't been based in this like toilet in backstage in Leipzig, if I could have been able to in that mindset that I was in, if I could have been able to go straight into another situation where I could have done what I was fixated on doing, then maybe the outcome of the whole thing would have been different. So maybe. Now I look back on it, I'm like, that was the universe's way of just trying to prevent you that bit longer until you could kind of calm yourself down, gather your thoughts, spoke to our management at the time and said, look, is there anybody you know? Because I was like, I'm not, al- I'm not an alcoholic, but I'm understanding that my mindset as it is right now needs some refining, otherwise I'm going to become one. Because for me to have got as drunk as I did that night was kind of really out of character. And yet they put me on to music support and I, I almost felt like finally for the first time I was talking to somebody who understood what I was saying yeah. rather than, and it wasn't me explaining myself and either A, expecting judgment or worse off, telling somebody else going, yeah, I know how you feel because I'm going through this. Sometimes you just want to turn around and go, I feel this shit. Can you help me dissect it? And yeah. And it also being something that's completely, I don't want to say neutral, but in essence, they, they don't know you like that. Like it's different to your mum or your dad or your best friend or your whatever. And that's what I found. I mean, w- within like even like an hour and a half long conversation, I instantly felt like there's been so many things that we've been able to unravel in this one conversation that's taken me years of trying to figure out why I feel this way and what's going on. And it was... Yeah, it was kind of like um, a bit of a renaissance, to be honest. I instantly felt like, okay, I think I can do this, actually. And I've, I've definitely had, you know, a few months later, my grandmother passed away and we were very close. And I actually I kind of think if, again, those two things have been closer, that really, like, kind of profound, bad experience I had on tour and her passing away, and I, there hadn't been... The bridge of of music support then i i I think 100 i wouldn't be here so i definitely i've said this to to matt several times there's no doubt in my mind that without what you guys do i I wouldn't be here um so i'm internally grateful for that and i'm kind of i feel like what's been really it's almost like as soon as i started that journey i kind of feel like i started a similar journey or i had the same sort of trajectory as like tyson fury i know it sounds crazy but like I was seeing what he was doing and he was just starting to open up about the demon demons he had and all this different stuff. And it's almost became like this very taboo thing or, you know, something that would like, say like, you know, if you're like doing touring or you're doing a press shoot, whatever, and someone's like, I can't man, just get on with it. Like whatever, like now it's the fact that we have this like open forum in which they were really, and I think society has improved, you know, leaps and bounds because of it. But like, you're in this place now where you can turn around and go, like, hey, not today. I'm not in the right headspace for it. So give me a break or I'm not coming without someone being like, oh, they're being difficult or, or why are they being a prima donna or making it about them or whatever. So it's been really beautiful to see over, I guess, what the last sort of six years or so, I suppose. Yeah. You know, seeing that change from that night that I had. So yeah, I think what you guys do is is and I, what you what you guys do, but also just the converse, it's now actually helped me going through that experience and the 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 sort of support that I had from you guys has helped me help people, which yeah with, without it's I guess it's like just embedded stuff subconsciously that like, you know, me being able to understand my own mind, I think has maybe helped me be able to at least understand a little bit of maybe what somebody else would want and the amount of people i've said hey i'm not digging you out but i think you could really benefit from talking to somebody because yeah. again there's that stigma of oh going to therapy or, or or talking about your mental health is like has a negative connotation like you're weak or you know you haven't got your shit together it's actually the exact opposite you know if you're if you're out of shape you go to the gym you yeah. know you go for a run yeah. If your mind's out of shape and not feeling healthy, why are we not doing something to strengthen it? And yeah, you know, why is that stigmatized when going to the gym is not? You know? 
exactly so amazing we 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 you know we drink i drank because i didn't have the emotional toolkit to kind of change what i needed to change in my life um you know so so i i drank away the feeling i drank away the pain um, mm. was actually you're absolutely right we need we, with what we know now we need to be saying look you know what's going on mate you know you need to talk to somebody there's music support there's talking therapies there's all kinds of there's all kinds of help you know we know that we need to change our lives in order to change the way we feel not drink the pain away that's created by our lives because mm. that just leads to ruin you know so mm. it's really kind of you to to say that but you know I, I, music support would wouldn't be anything without the courage people the courage of the people that call us and you know reach out for help so you know it's a definitely a, a two-way street for sure it's definitely one of those situations as well i think that like you don't know you've hit rock bottom until you hit rock bottom yeah and my my only hope for people in general is that they hit rock bottom and before going through then to the next phase that i went into think hang on we need to do something or i need to do something about this before but mm -hmm. it's and I guess that's where the courage comes from, but we've all got it within us. You know, sometimes it feels like hopeless or if you feel like this isn't too great, but there's always a way. And, and interestingly enough, like on that exact tour that this picture represents, we wrote a song, which then was, was called Finish What I Started. And we actually put it on Sucker Punch, our last record. And I think one of the reasons that I didn't push, you know, we had to have a song for like six years and for it to not come out. I think one of the main reasons that I wasn't pushing it to come out was because I knew what I mean, because we wrote it on the roast. I knew what I was saying. I knew what I was talking about. And I wasn't ready. I, 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 at that point, I hadn't even began my journey of understanding myself, my mind, and mm. how to maintain a healthy mind and to look after myself. But I was scared of like, because it's very blatantly obvious what the song's about when you listen to it. Um, yeah. And actually, at the time when I wrote, wrote it, finish what I started was, it was, you know, kind of like a tagline of like ending your life, but actually what it's now turned into over years of allowing me to live with it more and make some little changes here and there. It's now about like finishing, finishing what you started in terms of like your journey of recovery and that pursuit of acceptance and happiness. And maybe you only really get that in the later stages of your life. I don't know, but like, it's always going to be a work in progress because happiness is like just fleeting moments, I guess, of that. Yeah. Um, I think this is a big misconception, isn't there? That we, we A, because we do the jobs that we do, we should be really happy and grateful all the time. Yeah. But actually, we're just normal people within, within that reality. So, yeah. you know, our, our lives tend to be extremes of either, you know, certainly mine was extreme happiness or extreme misery and, and yeah. um, you know what recovery's given me is this sort of nice balance you know some days are, are a bit I'm a bit sad and other days I'm, I'm happier but you know it's way more in in balance than it was when I was when I was um, out of control you know it's, it's, it's like that I don't know if you've ever had this experience but like I remember well I'm sure you have but like the dopamine levels of like the first time we ever played the main stage at Reading which played Leeds on the Friday, Reading on the Saturday. And I was at home at mum and dad's house in my pants watching match today on the Sunday. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, there's no way I'm, that, there's no way that this is the same thing. Like, and so it was the other thing of like trying to understand, like, did I just dream that situation or is it reality? And I think those highs are so massive. Yeah. I'm trying to explain it to people. Which is why I think, you know, it's kind of well, like, it's another drug, isn't it? It's a, it's it's a drug, drug in and of itself. Yeah, a hundred percent. And then you get and you get addicted to it. And then the other thing that happens and you're like, when like, you know, if you have things where the success fluctuates or, you know, we've always kind of been lucky because like we've been really successful in England and we've always had to graft for even just the tiniest little bit of success elsewhere in the world. Yeah. So we always get that sort of like, well, I say we're lucky, but we have that yo-yo thing of like, play a big show in England, go to uh, fucking Tokyo and play to 300 people. And you're like, oh, cool. Yeah. You know, you're starting again. America, same sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yo-yo's over there all the time. One minute you're really hot, next minute you're really cold. Yeah. So we've kind of got used to that. But the first few times we did that sort of stuff, I was like, 
A, this makes me grateful for England, but B, I'm like, how am I supposed to, you know, get through this stuff? But yeah. it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all experience, and I think it's again one of those things that we're just talking about it is usually the best thing. Well, yeah, I, I, I think it's really important to say as well that um, you know, we've, having just talked about suicide, and you know, I can identify a lot with being in that place and not going through with it, um, and uh, it's really not something we would not talk about this lightly mm. um and i think anyone who might have been triggered by what we've been talking about um you know there's there's plenty of help out there samaritans we want to talk to somebody or need to sort of talk to somebody there's you know our helpline the music support helpline is 0800 030 if you need to speak to somebody or you know grab a mate and um talk to them or or a counselor or a therapist or whatever and you know just just remember you're not alone um that's the thing that's the main thing you're never alone it feels like you are but you're not and and i think maybe when you were sat in that um bathroom drinking on your own with those suicidal thoughts josh you maybe thought that you know you know what what was what was in terms of you know your thinking we did you feel like you were on your own or it was just like i just gotta i've just gotta finish it I've just got to end this because it's crap or what was happening yeah I just, I just well i just well i just felt very misunderstood but mainly by myself mm. i don't know if that makes sense but i didn't understand myself in the slightest i didn't understand yeah makes you know, a lot of sense I, I i i couldn't i just couldn't get my head around and i also because like i've always been like quite a laid back like happy person so i couldn't understand this like deep deep sadness i was feeling i just couldn't get my head around it mm. um but you know like and that again to go back to what i was saying before about like how how you guys have helped me and then when you just mentioned obviously like the, the telephone lines and stuff like i i did a, a thing and i've always said to our fans since i posted about it but i was like my dms are always open if Pete, and i've spoken to probably about somewhere like 40 50 people that we've like shared back and forth multiple times about what they're feeling what they're thinking and i've chatted to them and i think again it's like you know i'm not the way that me being as open as i am isn't trying to like trivialize it i'm trying to normalize it because i know like how scary yeah. when you when you feel that bad it's like oh shit you know so i think it's it's not trying to um I'm also not trying to glorify it either, I guess. I don't know. No, no, I think, but I, but I, I understand that what you're saying is that when you've been so low, you know, there's almost a duty of care to mm. be vulnerable and open about that stuff in order to avoid other people falling into the same hole. You know, it's yeah. like that, that old image of, of you know, um, getting into the hole with somebody and helping them climb out when all of these people are just walking past the top looking in and going oh god how's he going to get out of there you know it's like yeah, yeah you know we climb in that hole with people and we help them get out you know that's that's what we do by being um male and vulnerable and you know just having that courage to talk about that stuff which a lot of men don't and that's why men my age 45 to 50 is the highest suicide rate right. in the uk you know it's not it's not rocket science it's like if you talk about that stuff if more men spoke about that subject and what was going on for them then there'd be less suicides i'm absolutely convinced of it i've yeah. got no scientific proof to back that statement up mind you but i'm i'm convinced that that would be the case well it's, it's that idea that toxic masculinity as well isn't it yeah like you know we're quite happy to go into the pub and go you're right, mate. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Or you're a bit quiet tonight. And you're like, yeah, don't worry about it. Next round, let's talk about the football, girlfriends, music, whatever. Anything else but our feelings. And I think it's only actually what was really interesting is that by me having my experience, then I had a, one of my best mates outside of music and probably in my life really like had this, this breakdown with me and like he went through this stuff. And like, you know, since then, I've, I kind of, I, I don't know if, I don't, I don't really surround myself with like people that aren't willing to get deep and level out. I think it's a yeah. really, it's actually for me, it says a lot about somebody as a person. I don't mind seeing, I don't mind. I prefer to see somebody being vulnerable and 
and kind of and you know bare bones if you like and just playing it's them. More, don't you think it's just more real? Though? Yeah, it's more exactly. like being it's being real. like um, being the blokey bloke to me is more is more fake than hundred percent than I, you know I, I, being true to your feelings and how you you know it's just the I guess the problem is is finding people that are okay receiving that you know and, and hearing that stuff you know that's the that's the problem i found is that i very often have shared with the wrong bloke yeah. who is not capable of dealing with an emotional conversation <laughs> you know what i mean 100%. Um, yeah so brilliant thanks so much for sharing that it's um it's big it's big important stuff so i'm glad you made it mate i'm glad I'm really glad you got through it and you're here to help others through their struggles and and um helping us as well appreciate it right uh image four what this image represents i was flicking through loads and loads of photos and i just i came across this one but this was taken by india fleming who toured with us it really is a moment of pure joy this for me because i only do this when the gigs are, <laughs> are amazing you know when you're sort of on autopilot you're not you don't have to think about what you're doing. You're really in the moment. The gig's flying past so quick yeah. because you're just in flow state and, and everything's just happening on um, um, on autopilot, like I said. And, and it's just an amazing night. And and uh, I do this. I mean, loads of people do it, but this this whale spout of water, my tech hates it, as you can imagine, because he, yeah, yeah. he has to dry it all up. But sorry, sorry, Al. I, I'm, you know, public public apology there. Look but um, this is taken oh. at, at Brixton Academy, yeah. as you can see, and um, it's just just represents the uh, the homecoming for the band. Obviously, Skin uh, and Cass are from London. Skin from Brixton, particularly, and, and Ace and I lived in the area of I'm from Whitby originally in the northeast, but um, we've lived in the south for, for a long, long time. So this is our hometown gig, and um, it just represents recovery to me. I, I wouldn't be there doing that if I hadn't got some help and I hadn't reached out and I hadn't, you know, fallen to pieces and then put myself back together again with, with you know, lots and lots of help. You know, there's lots that I think about when I go into this, when I when I go into this picture, you know, all, all the the help that the band's given me to all the understanding they've given me, the time they've given me to sort of recover and 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 my wife also tours with us now, so she's just out of shot on the right there, and and um, that's an amazing thing mm. to have her on tour, you know, doing backing vocals and um, and just being there because it me it give, what it gives me is a um, an element of consistency throughout every day, mm. um, and we have this joke that we you know sort of turn around, turn a corner in the venue or, or whatever, and I go oh there you are. There you are again, you know, because we're because we're at home, we're together, and on tour we're together, which might drive some people nuts, but actually, it's really lovely and and really important for me because it just like I say, it keeps consistency throughout all the days. And we, yes, it's a very different reality to the one we live at home, but when we get home, we go for a long dog walk and we reconnect on that level, you know. And then when we're on tour, we're up, we're on tour and we're working and whatnot, but. Um, I just think it represents, you know, my sort of successful, not that, I was going to say my successful journey in recovery, but that's misleading because I don't consider myself cured ever. I consider my, my recovery is very much uh, a daily process. You know, it's like, wait, if I do the things that I need to do in order to set myself up well for the day, then my day goes much better you know than if mm -hmm. i don't do those things you know so sleep well eat well get some exercise I'm not doing that at the moment um but i am digging ditches so yeah. um <laughs> you know so if I, if I do the right things then then i have a good day and and it's only through the band loving me my family loving me and me learning to love me as well that i'm able to still be in a band and still play and still play in front of you know great audiences all across europe and um that's the thing isn't i'm really it? grateful for that you know i'm yeah. really grateful for that i think that's the weird thing as well sometimes that like like you know I've, i'm like you i think we i'm similarly to you i'm very lucky that i've got you know a beautiful family who 
who love me and you know and then you also get these sort of like admiration and love from whilst being on stage and it's such a weird thing when like you can be so loved and yet really not love yourself and I think that's the kind yeah. of the, the journey that I think we're all going to be on for our whole lives I think is that just that that sort of serenity of going you know what I accept myself I love myself and I think it's important for people to remember obviously ourselves included but like you know that's always gonna be a bit of a work in progress but I think you know we're both so like we're both very lucky that you've got loving families and people yeah. in life that you know I mean the way that I look at the lads in unit six is I've I'd always I, I love my sister obviously but I'd always wanted a brother as well as a sister and um you know I've got four you know and I kind of like we, we've been the same life since we we're 16 15 16 year old kids so it's like it's, it's very rare and I think yeah it's um I think it makes the the lows bearable and the highs that bit more sweet and enjoyable when you know there's so much love around you so yeah absolutely. absolutely moving on to the perfect fifth and final image um talk us through this one josh put simply it's the first time that um we met the food fighters obviously it's just dave in this picture but it was the first time that we'd sort of been around that and it kind of felt like it's very it's very interesting when you meet your heroes or your idols because more often than not people tell you not to because <laughs> It doesn't always go the way you want. Um, yeah. But with Dave and, and um, with Mr. Grohl even, you know, like he's one of those rare people that I think he understands it on every single level. Um, and I, he strikes me as somebody that could walk into any room with people from any background and be able to know exactly how to sort of chameleon himself, if you like, yeah. the, the, the version of himself that he should be in that exact moment. But What's interesting about this is that I remember that day because I think I'm only, I think I'm 20 in that picture, maybe 19. And we were playing tea in the park and, uh, oh no, sorry. No, that's not it. No, we went to see them at Milton Keynes Bowl. Um, and the first time we'd met them was at tea in the park and me and Dan, our drummer, physically ran over to him across like the guest area. Like, Dave, 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 Dave. And he could have been like, well, fucking, you know, whatever. And just like walked off, had to be like, we were like, can we have a picture, can we have a picture? And he could just been like, yeah, picture and, and fucked off. But the first thing he did was like, whoa, lads, let's just take a second here. Yeah. I'm Dave, what's your name? And, you know, and just the way it was an early lesson, which actually, which was showed me how to, how to react to somebody being really fucking excited. Yeah. Because I think maybe up until that point, you know, we had we had a we had a lot of young fans and we were that age as well. They were very young. They were sort of like twelve, you know, really twelve, thirteen to yeah. age would be eighteen. So like, you know, I was always like, oh man, I wish they wouldn't just run over and scream in your face. Um, but <laughs> what he didn't know he was doing is he was just passing on the baton to me in that occasion uh, to be like, you know, hey, this is how you can make somebody still feel seen. Um, but also yeah. bring it back to a place which feels like you're getting something out of it as well as them in terms of like you're getting to know your fans, you're getting to have a correspondence. So you don't just become this commodity, which is a picture and you leave sort of thing. Another thing that um, that I heard about Dave was that every time a band joins them on tour or sharing a bit, not like at a festival, but joy, sharing a stage in the, at a gig or like write a note and a bottle of champagne whilst the artists on stage, they come back, it's like a new thing, you know, and we basically nicked that. It, it was like a good thing, you know, we were like, I've gone, right, that's how you treat everybody. Yeah. And that's how it should be done. And, you know, the amount of bands that we've had come out with us where, you know, they'll be on stage, I'll come back and like, I'll always leave like a note, little note being like, here's our T TM's manager, his uh, number, here's my number, you need anything, you come straight to me and we'll, we'll sort it out. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think there's been, so, I think he's a great teacher. I think he's a great example of how to be undoubtedly, you know, the biggest living, you know, rock star, if you like, yeah. um, but still, you know, still the most amazing, wholesome, um, yeah, pure person. We had the, we had the same lesson from, um, uh, from you too, when we did it, we did two gigs with him. Well, that must've been 96 as well. It was when we were doing, the, you know, our, our our sort of most um our, our, well is it yeah our most successful period is what i'm trying to say mm. and um we did a few shows with them and we got off we came off stage and 
because we're thinking like you know they're going to fly in fly out and we'll never see them we got off stage and there was a bottle of champagne like you say a note from bono but also an invitation to the dressing room so we were like we went mm. over to the dressing room they said hey how are you doing have a drink we sat in there for i don't know 10 15 minutes just having a chat and then they were like right we're going to get in our limos and go to the airport and fly home because it they fly home every night because they can, you know. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. What a brilliant way to take care of your mental health. Um, yeah, yeah. And that taught us, and we've done the same as you, we've done that ever since. That really showed us how to treat younger bands coming up, coming through. It was like, pass that on because then they'll do it mm. and then they'll pass it on. And then the whole industry just becomes better, you yeah. know, because of those people that, that you know, if, if anyone, if, if anyone, kind of could justifiably be an arsehole it's these massive rock stars you know mm -hmm. like bono and like dave Grohl, but they're not they're lovely and they're nice and and that's the lessons that need to be sort of passed on isn't it really yeah 100%, um, 100%. yeah so and i've, I've got a, a quite a, a bit of a sad story but i really didn't have have any choice um when we took we met dave uh belfour festival when they do you think they'd released I think it was on their first record and we had this food fight with them over the oh you know the, those dressing rooms where it's just like a curtain and, and yeah yeah you know you're not in a room you're just in a sort of festival curtained off kind of hall kind of thing we had this food fight with them over the curtain and then we sort of had a bit of a chat played some scrabble and had a picture taken but then years later i met him at a festival when i was with feeder and he he was like hey mark how are you doing come and have some um so, some uh, Jägermeister. He had this box of tiny little <laughs> bottles of Jägermeister, and I was just like, I can't, Dave. I, can't. I just got sober. I'd literally got sober, and then done this. I was on this tour, <laughs> and I started so desperately wanted to join in. But you know, it's probably the first time that I really started taking my own self care seriously. So I had to say no, and I didn't go to the party, and I didn't get drunk with Dave. Dave Grohl, and I haven't got that story to tell, but. I am alive and I'm content, so I so guess maybe, that's probably maybe, better. Yeah, maybe you flipping the script though in itself is maybe well, I'd say an even better story to turn down shots with Dave Grohl and going and getting pissed at a party to be. <laughs> you know what? I just I'm on my own thing right now. Is yeah, yeah. Is, is a far bigger testament, I think. Is it, look, anybody respectfully to to the, and also respect to those that don't get that invitation, but anybody can say yes to going and getting fucked up with the Foo Fighters. You know, it's not a difficult job. You do it with you know with open arms, but to to not says that um, says a lot about your your mental strength. Well, thank you for that. Thank well, you for that. It was it was in its infancy. I'll tell you, it was really, it was really difficult. Um, but um, well, look, that brings us to sort of the end of the the, the perfect five photos. Um, just before we finish, is there any advice um, or maybe suggestions is a better word to use? Are, are there any suggestions you'd give to anyone watching this video who's feeling anxious or vulnerable? Um, about about uh, lockdown, about you know yeah. stuff going on in their personal lives, about their work, about anything. You know what what would you suggest? Um, I yeah, I always feel a great level of pressure with those kind of questions, just because I think that it's subjective, right? And I think everybody has their own sort of coping mechanisms or and whatnot. Yeah, what I would say is that. Um, I think yeah, to start off with, don't be so hard on yourself. I know that probably sounds like a very, very basic thing to say, but especially in 2021, with all the noise that you have through social media and all this sort of, sort of stuff, which is basically saying, this is the way you should be. You should care about this. You should dress this way. You should be this size, especially for young women as well. I think I know we spoke a lot about you know toxic masculinity and the pressures of men but you know um it's uh, it's a it's a minefield i think for any parent right now trying to bring up their children in this sort of environment at an age where you know their influence people are being influenced left right and center by things that are just not very um not very important to be honest and i think yeah just to focus on try and focus on even things that bring you joy 
and it doesn't matter how how big or how big or how small a slice of joy they give you. Um, but I was listening to this podcast today with Fern Cotton, and I believe his name is Rishi Patel. Yeah. Um, and Happy you know, place is cold, isn't it? I think. Pardon. Happy place is cold, isn't that's it? The one, yeah, that's the one. My sister put me onto it, and I was yeah, yeah, it's listen- really good. It's really good, and you know, it's something something as simple as um. You know, Rome's not built in a day, right? That old kind of cliche, but like, it's just talk about little things that we can all do, you know, that sort of 10, 15 minutes of exercise, you know, and that, you know, literally walking, you know, around your park or whatever, 15 minutes, fresh air, um, but also just taking, you know, things that you know you enjoy and things that you know bring you happiness, just giving yourselves those little things and, and, and not necessarily talking about drinking, smoking, eating bad food but things that you know painting playing an instrument mm. watching a tape favorite tv show whatever it might be and just little i mean he, he puts it way more eloquently than i just have but i think it's just really important in today's society to to take some alleviate yourself of some of the pressures of what you think you're supposed to be and just start trying to accept and embrace your shortcomings if you like yeah all the things that you think make you your imperfections because actually it's it's our imperfections that really do make us you know who we are and um mm. yeah i just i always get really worried when i not really worried that's all i'm saying it, but I, I i always feel like quite helpless when i'm talking to to young people especially over the last year when i've been talking to our fans on you know instagram and stuff like that and through messaging and just try to think how can I help put these people on the path of just kind of just loving themselves because mm. especially over the year we've been inside right everyone's just on their phones all the time looking at people that are living these so-called perfect lives and you know um I think what we've done today is looking at things that on the surface look perfect and could be perceived as being perfect perfect situations mm. and maybe not so and I think that um yeah, I always, I always ground zero for me, and 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 when, whenever I'm going through a little thing, is give myself a bit of a credit, give myself a pat on the back for doing something as trivial as getting up, taking a shower, and walking my dog. That's victory number one, you know. And small yeah. little victories throughout the day can be massive, you know. And I think that would be my advice, is because sometimes things feel so overwhelming, like the magnitude of you know real change takes so much time that um the pressure that comes with trying to get through that transition quickly so you can get to the, the other side even quicker is unrealistic and i think just giving yourself credit and giving yourself little small things that you can do for yourself mm. uh, that will improve your either physical state or your mental state is is massive so yeah that would be my advice how, yeah. how useful it will be i don't know but i hope somebody finds it some yeah well i think i think it's like uh, just the a simple thing like you know put your phone away let's talk about you know let's have a chat you know how are you and then ask him again how are uh, no, you know how are you i don't know where i got that from but it's really really good and it works really really well to ask them twice yeah you know how somebody are and like just tell them to put the phone away so they're not distracted and let's go for a walk or like if somebody when i'm coaching i know that if if somebody feels really really uncomfortable sitting and chatting then we get up and we start walking or we build a fire or we whittle a spoon or you know what i mean it's, mm-hmm. it's, there's lots of ways that you can help people to chat about what's going on for them but i think i think you're right it, it, you know find the joy in your day and if you're struggling just reach out for help you know uh, and don't don't be don't be you know frightened you know just reach out and see what happens because you're not alone and you never are even when you think you are so um amazing uh, i guess um i guess that's it um thank you so much for for, for chatting with us and um taking time out of your your day uh, and you must be super busy with the the album and getting ready and uh, for all the ideas must be like flowing with regard to the tour and the production and all that kind of stuff so um i really appreciate you taking time out to do this and and sharing your experience and and strengthen your hope you know with everybody i think it's really important it's super important you know 
Um, so thank you. Absolute pleasure, mate. Anytime. Awesome. Nice one, man. <laughs>